Hey, welcome back. Uh, thank you for joining me for part four of my One Night in Cars on uh, card review. In this video, we're going to cover uh, all the neutral cards that I haven't touched on yet. We've already done the class cards and some of the early reveal cards in my previous videos. So without further ado, let's wrap this up. First off, we've got a Runic Egg. Uh, Runic Egg is a 0-2 for one that has a Death Rattle draw card. This card is pointless. Uh, it doesn't really matter because we have Loot Hoarder, which is a 2-1 for two that draws a card. So for one extra mana, you trade one health, you gain two attack, and you have the exact same death rattle. And a creature that has attack intrinsically is much more able to activate a death rattle effect. The problem with a, a creature card that has zero attack is that it requires an external enabler to be able to activate its death rattle effect. You know, Nerubian Egg was good because it was a 0-2 a, a that had a 4-4 four, four come out of it as a death rattle. And a 4-4 four, four is worth like 3.5 mana. So you basically had a 3.5 mana effect on a 2 cost death rattle that you would generally enable and trade somehow. Um, this is not a 3.5 mana effect. It's on a 0-2 for 1 that still requires an enabler. It's just not good enough. In Arena, it's beyond not good enough. It's, it's one of the worst kind of cards you can pick. It has no attack. You know, playing this on curve is like playing nothing. Your opponent's never going to kill it. You basically hope that they're going to hit it with some stray AoE effect, or it just sits there the whole game and it doesn't do anything. It takes up a spot in your deck, you draw it late game, and it's like not drawing a card at all. Runic Egg is abominably bad. Very shitty. Super not good. Pantry Spider. Pantry Spider is weird. Um, it's a little better than I think it seems like it is because it is a beast and both sides of it are a beast. So it's effectively a 2-6 beast for three. But the problem is that it's not much better than Carrion Grub, which is a 2-5 beast for three. And Carrion Grub has a more immediate impact on the board and has more synergy with things like Houndmaster. So if a 2-5 for three wasn't good enough, a 2-6 for three that has the Death Rattle enabler in the middle of it probably isn't either. Um, Hunter's not exactly getting smacked around and it isn't super vulnerable to board sweep effects right now. Like That's not what suppresses Hunter. So Pantry Spider, which would have been a great answer to a meta like that, just isn't good enough. Um, in Arena, it's okay. It's very slow. Um, if you play this on curve, you're, you're generally going to fall behind because it's going to get traded up with by a 3-2, and then that 3-1 that it's left behind can kill the other half of it the next turn. It's very slow, very weak, um, just not a very good card overall in Arena. There's a small chance you'll see it in Constructed, um, but I don't really think that is likely. I think it's a pretty bad card. Arcane Anomaly. Uh, Arcane Anomaly is a 2-1 for 1 that gets plus 1 health every time you cast a card. It's kind of like a, a flip-flopped Mana Worm. Um, unfortunately, it's just not as good as Mana Worm because it is very likely that you're not going to play enough spells. If you play this on Curve on turn 1, you're not going to play enough spells to get it up to a health value that doesn't just get traded with by 2-2. Two -two. Um, that is kind of good. Trading your 2-1 up onto a 2-2 two -two is fine, but the problem is the, the damage it does to your deck at, for having it in there and you draw it late game, you don't get it on curve, is pretty immense. Um, Mana Worm at least has the chance to hit the board you know, on a late turn paired with things like Frost Nova and get up to a 4-3 four, four, or, four, or 5-3 and, and become this relevant threat, even though it's a one-mana card. This guy, the best he ever does is he gets really healthy and then he still just dies. Um, unfortunately, just not going to be good enough. Uh, you might maybe see it a little bit in Priest because Priest is just that bad right now, and the health scaling works a little bit better with Priest because you can heal him and then keep casting spells and heal him and casting spells and healing casting spells. And he could maybe be like a uh, a pocket play against Zoo for Priest, but I still don't think he's good enough even in that context. In Arena, very bad. I mean, he's a one drop, so you'll be happy to have him sometimes because at least he's a one drop. But you're not going to have enough spells, especially not spells you want to play on the curve in Arena, generally, to make Arcane Anomaly worth it. Menagerie Magician. Uh, he is a 4 4 for 5 that gives a random, friendly beast, dragon, and murloc plus 2 plus 2 each. He's just a strictly bigger, strictly better version of Zubat. The problem is, I just don't think it's good enough. Yeah, if you construct the perfect board state and you are able to get all three, you've gotten a 10-10 for five. But at the same time, you've already come into your turn with three creatures on the board, which means you're doing fine. And you're probably not playing this guy on curve. The odds of you having something to play this guy with on curve are pretty low. 
if you hit one guy with this and you play him on curve, he basically is a 6-6 six, six for 5, which is great. But unless that's reliable, it's just not worth putting in your deck. And I think that's the problem with the whole curator archetype, the whole beast, murloc, dragon, multi-tribe archetype, is it's very unreliable. Um, I just don't think you're going to see very much of this guy because there, there just aren't enough cases in which he is good. In Arena, eh, he's pretty bad. 4-4 four, four for 5 is not good. You want to play him on curve, and the odds of you having something to trigger this guy with are pretty abysmal, honestly. So I think he's bad in Arena as well. Arcano Smith. It is a 3-2 for 4 that, as a battle cry, summons a 0-5 minion with taunt. First of all, the wording on this is weird. Every other card in Hearthstone basically says a uh, uh, zero whatever or one one something, right? A one one Murloc, a one one Steward. So what is a zero five minion? Like, what's up with that? That's really strange. Um, I'm holding out hope that that means something in specific, like with this guy. But I think they just got lazy or inconsistent. I don't really know what the explanation is, but I do know this card's shit. Um, a 3-2 for 4 gets traded with by Wonder Ops, and a 0-5 doesn't really matter. It's just like, kind of like gain 5 health. And, you know, 3-2 for 4 gain 5 armor I don't think would get played. Uh, and likewise, I don't think this will get played. And Arena, it's even worse, does basically nothing on the curve. He gets traded up with by one, by, by one drops. Um, and that 0-5 gets torn through very easily. Uh, man, it's just a bad card. Violet Illusionist is a 4-3 for 3. During your turn, your hero is immune. This card is really interesting. If this card was a 3-4 three, for 3, I think it would be huge. I think it would have a huge impact on the metagame. Um, as it is, I think it's mostly just a tool for, like, Reno Lock. Uh, maybe Zoo, maybe Warrior. That's about it. It just dies very easily to three twos for two, or three twos for one, like Flame Imp. Um, it is interesting. I mean, it's got a cool turn five application in Hand Lock, where it can it can basically be a five mana four three draw card on Battle Cry that has some other extra effects, and that's kind of cool. Um, you know, you can play a Flame Imp alongside this, not take the damage. You can play Life Tap alongside it, not take the damage. Uh, you can play Wraith Guard or Wrath Guard alongside it and swing into something and not take the damage. So it's got some weird interactions with Warlock, which is the only place I think you're likely to see it. It is really cool with Fool's Bane. It's a cool combo with Fool's Bane. Still doesn't make Fool's Bane good. It's a mediocre card overall that I think will have some experimental, unpredictable uses. In Arena, I think it's also pretty bad. It gets traded up with too easily, and you're unlikely to be able to build the kind of deck synergy that you need uh, to make the effect really strong. If you happen to have a lot of uh, weapons, uh, or you happen to be a druid, maybe it's good enough, or a rogue, maybe it's good enough, but generally I think it's pretty poor in Arena due to the stat line. It's too fragile. Next up, we've got Avian Watcher. It is a 3-6 for 5 that, if you control secret, becomes a plus 1, plus 1 in taunt. So it basically becomes a 4-7 taunt for 5. This card is really interesting. I think this card, along with Medivh's Valet, might resurrect a uh, mage, like secret mage. Um, but I feel like, unfortunately, a 4-7 with taunt is like a little awkward when you have other archetypes and other cards that can get even beefier taunts for better prices. I mean, you can get a 4-6 with Taunt for 5 just all day long and Druid. You can get two 4-6s for 7. You can get a 6-8 for 8, you know. So a 4-7 Taunt, while pretty good on curve, requires you to have a secret active, which isn't reliable. If you don't have that secret active and you don't get the battle cry, it's a very weak card. Um, I do not think it will be enough to make some sort of secret-oriented mage archetype playable. Um, you might see it as a one of in, like, weird like mid-range hunter but it's not actually a beast despite being bird-like <laughs> it is a beast that'd be a whole different story but yeah uh it's just not good enough in arena it's terrible you're unlikely to have the synergy and a three six for five is just absolutely not good enough you know bog creeper is not good enough so this is absolutely not good enough if you can't reliably have the synergy moat lurker is a three three for six that assassinates something, just destroys a minion as a battle cry, but as a death rattle, it resummons that minion. This card is really interesting. Um, it's not a, a new or innovative effect. We've seen this in other card games, like a, with Oblivion Ring. Uh, there's like a um, Faceless Butcher, I think, is the card I'm thinking of for magic. But the implication of this in Hearthstone, because of the way Silence works, is really interesting. Um, you can play this guy assassinate something and then silence it and not give them their guy back. Um, you can play this guy 
assassinate something that has a buff on it and give them that guy back without the buff, like Ancient of, of War can be given back as a 5-5 five, five instead of a 5-10. You can play this guy, uh, kill one of your own guys, get your guy back at full health. You can kill this guy to, or you can play this guy and kill a guy and trigger a death. I mean, he's got a lot of really weird implications and, and applications. I'm just not sure if those are good enough to make it 3-3 for 6 ever see play. If you think about it, he's kind of like a 3-3 for 1 that assassinates something, but it has a big drawback. I don't know. He's hard to predict. This is one of the hardest to predict cards in this set. Um, but it's really interesting. I love its design. In Arena, I think it might be slightly playable, um, just because removal is at such a premium, and you can get so much tempo by killing their guy and creating a guy, that even if they get their guy back, it still messes up with their tempo enough that he might be good. So yeah. Molurker, hard to predict, but a card I really like. Along with the portal cycle, we also have a new card for the giant cycle. We have Arcane Giant, who is an 8-8 for 12, whose cost goes down by one for every spell you've played this game. This is a lot better than Frost Giant, because there are a lot more decks you can build that cast a large number of low-cost spells. Priest, actually, does a lot of low-cost spells, so it's possible you might actually see Arcane Giant as a one-of in Control Priest, just because it can be played very cheaply later in the game, you can wipe their board out and drop this threat all at once. You might maybe see it in like Reno Freeze Mage or Handlock or things that, that need to have 30 different cards. It might be good enough to snag one of the bottom spots in one of those decks. Um, overall, it's probably just a bit too weak. It doesn't quite compete with, say, Sea Giant or Old School Molten Giant, but it definitely has a lot more potential than something like Frost Giant does. Very interesting card. In Arena, unfortunately, it's really bad in Arena. Uh, as always, you're not going to be able to reliably cast spells. You're not going to be happy casting spells. They don't have a board presence. They don't have as good of a tempo presence. You don't want to be doing that, and you might not survive long enough to cast this 8-8 if you can't cast a whole ton of really cheap spells. So in Arena, it's, it's going to be a pretty weak card. Sneaking in here at the last moment is Morose. Uh, he was actually released when I did part two of the series, but I just... I just didn't notice him because he has stealth. Uh, he's a 1-1 one, one for 3 who has stealth, and at the end of every turn, he puts a 1-1 one, one steward into play. Mm, if Ravage and Ghoul was not in 35% of the decks in this metagame, Moroz would be a good card. If there were not a 1 damage AoE effect in almost every powerful, viable deck right now, this guy might be a good card. The problem is that too many times he's going to drop down on turn 3, give you a single 1-1, one, one, and get caught up in a Ravaging Ghoul along with the rest of your board, and that's all she wrote. You, you've lost that card, you lost that whole turn, you probably end up losing the game. He's just not good enough. If you were a 1-2, we would be singing a different song. But because he himself is a 1-1, one, one, his stealth isn't very valuable in a metagame that has a lot of 1 damage AoE effects. I mean, hell, there's even another one printed in this adventure, uh, Maelstrom Portal, that I personally think we'll see play, that gets added to the list of cards that just kills Moroz. So uh, almost every class is playing one damage AoE sweepy effects, and those are just going to make Moros not be able to keep up. Um, in Arena, I actually think he's pretty good. He's a little slow, but uh, over the course of two turns, he's already created a 3-3 of value, and after that, he continues to scale up. Um, hitting the Paladin hero power is generally a pretty good thing, like it's powerful, and this guy's effectively giving you a, a two-mana hero power every turn. Um, not phenomenal, but there are a lot of actually really bad legendaries, so I can definitely see cases where I would take this in Arena and I would not lose sleep over it. And that wraps it up for the neutral cards review of One Night in Karazhan. Uh, we do have one more One Night in Karazhan video coming. I'm going to do a video where I just talk a little bit about some of my favorite cards and some of my predictions for One Night in Karazhan. Uh, I hope you'll join us for that. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please like, comment, and subscribe. If you hated it, please also you know comment and then like and subscribe if you feel masochistic. Um, if you enjoy politics and tabletop role-playing games, I encourage you to check out the Play Together project. It's another project that I'm involved in. We stream tabletop games at Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. EST on twitch.tv slash the play together project uh, give it a check uh, if you like it sweet if you don't that's cool you can still watch me here again thank you so much for joining me and I hope to see you next time for one night in cars on part 5 bye bye woo, 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 woo.